Aloha and welcome to another edition of Condo Insider, Hawaii's show about association living. Many of our residents, maybe a third or more, live in an association and our objective in this show is to talk about issues that affect boards of directors and owners and how they can have a good home and have quiet enjoyment of where they live. One of the things I've heard over and over again for the years I've been in the management business is boards and what are their duties they have a fiduciary responsibility. They have a conflict of interest. And what is this all about? You know, the pe homeowners and boards alike are always yelling and screaming at each other about what these duties and obligations are. So I've invited one of our great attorneys in the association industry and a good personal friend of mine, Nalan, to come and talk to us today about 514B and these issues of fiduciary duty and conflict of interest. So. Now, again, welcome to our show. So glad to be here again. Thank you, Richard. Remind us again a little about your background, you know, your family, how long you've been in Hawaii, your, the firm you work for, and mm -hmm. some of your volunteer efforts like at CAI. Mm -hmm. uh, I was born and raised in China. I came to Hawaii as a student and then uh, went to UH Law School. After graduation, I started my practice in condominium and community association representation. And I moved to the law firm, uh, Moto Oka and Rosenberg. We are one of the boutique firms in town specializing in representing associations. We handle their general matter consulting, um, you know, dispute resolution for the board, for the association, handle their litigation, their covenant enforcement, debt collection, foreclosure matters. Yeah, so it's been uh, over seven years for now. And you're also on the CAI Legislative Action Committee, correct? Yes. In fact, you've been the past chairman of that, I think, if I remember correctly. Yes, uh, the former chair and this year's vice chair, yeah. And so what does CII lack do, legislative action? What, what, are they, what is their role, what do they do? Uh, we basically represent, you know, the association industry. You know, we lobby for the associations uh, and the homeowners' interests in the legislature. Also, we uh, try to, you know, uh, keep all the members updated about what's going on in the association law field to educate all the board, the property managers, and the homeowners. Well, you know, one of the things I hear not that often, because I believe, frankly, that most boards want to do a good job. They, they're fair and they're equitable, and they try to do the right things. But I hear all the right time people say, that's a breach of your fiduciary duty. And I know 514B106 mm -hmm. says that the board members are a fiduciary. Yes. Can you kind of elaborate on that? What is, what is a fiduciary and what are their obligations of the fiduciary? Right. So a fiduciary, if you check the dictionary definition, it basically means someone has to act on behalf of the other's interest. So that means you really need to subordinate your own interest to the other person's interest. So in the board director's role, you owe a fiduciary duty to the association and all of its members, not to a certain homeowner, not to a certain group of homeowner, it's to the association. It involves actually includes a bundle of uh, duties you have to fulfill. So one of that is uh, duty of good faith. So when you take action as a board, you have to honestly believe the action you're taking is actually for the benefit of the association. A duty of obedience, you have to uh, make sure you manage the association's affairs in compliance with the statutes, uh, with the project documents of your project. Uh, duty of care, which is we also call a due diligence. You basically act as a ordinarily a prudent person would act in a reasonable, situ in a reasonable way in similar situations. Uh, you try to gather information, do some in investigation. You, you can rely on professionals you got to make your own judgment uh, in a reasonable way. And the most important one, of course, is the duty of loyalty. You owe your um, loyalty to the association. Uh, you cannot do like self-dealing. Uh, so basically, when there is conflict interest, you always make disclosure, make sure the disclosure is reflected in the board minutes, uh, in the meeting minutes. Well, I know that the statute itself refers to that a fiduciary in the same way, manner as the law. I think it's um, 414D. Yes. And, David. Um, and what is which, what law is 414D, and and does it have any uniqueness to this as far as defining a fiduciary or? Mm -hmm. or? 414D is the statute governs uh, nonprofit corporations in Hawaii. Uh, there is a whole section regarding uh, what 
the uh, directors and officers' uh, duties and their care should be uh, in uh, functioning as the director or officer of a nonprofit corporation. So basically, the condo statute says, you know, if you fulfill those uh, standards uh, as specified in 414D, uh, you, you are covered. You will not be breaching your fiduciary duty. Basically, it's it's a definition of the business judgment rule which the standard the court used to try to decide whether a board has breached his duty or not. So it can be said that as a fiduciary, your job is to the association as a whole. Yes. Impartial and all the due diligence and all the things you said. But it's probably true that the owners themselves are not fiduciaries to the association. They're probably just owners, right? They They're, are owners, yes. Yeah, they, they don't really have a, under the law, fiduciary duty to the association. They, yeah. They, they may have interest in what is decided, mm -hmm. but they're not really fiduciaries as an owner, mm -hmm. uh, technically speaking, under the law. Yeah, I mean, under agency law, I mean, for example, a managing agent, it would owe a fiduciary duty to the association, right? As right. an agent principal relationship, yeah. So. The statute also goes to some other duties and obligations of the board. So, you know, let's just say I own a unit there and, and I want, uh, I'm really angry and I want to get on the board and I have people of Sapali. Could I vote myself and my wife on the board? From uh, one unit, you can only, there's only one representative allowed from each unit. So you cannot have two representatives from the same unit be on the board. So if I own unit 101 and that's all I owned, mm -hmm. I couldn't, the, the association couldn't elect myself and my wife for Unit 101. But if I owned Unit 101 and 102, mm -hmm. more than one unit, then in fact, in theory, I could represent 101 and my wife could represent 102. You're right. Because I've seen some situations where, and unfortunately, it, it can get out of hand where you maybe have a developer in a newly formed association mm -hmm. that because they have unsold units may own mm -hmm. 100 or 200 units remaining mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. during that proposition when they have to form the association mm -hmm. they have control of the board because of the fact they have a large financial interest they still have in my example 100 unsold units yeah for uh for developer controlled boards you know those uh, directors officers uh, who are you know affiliated with the developer they have to be make sure they, they are clear, there is case law, clear stating, regardless whether they have affiliation with a the developer, they also owe fiduciary duty to the association. If they breach their fiduciary duty, they will be held liable. Yeah, yeah. I, I, which makes sense, but yeah. for our listening audience, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's important to know you may see more than one uh, representative from a developer, and that's somewhat common when they own such mm -hmm. a large financial interest of unsold property. But then, in fact, they still owe the same fiduciary duty to the board, mm -hmm. or the, excuse me, to the, to the association, outside of their personal interest with respect to the developer. And so, you were saying, for example, that the uh, uh, managing agent you know, has a fiduciary duty. What if I own a unit in a condo and I'm a, I work for the managing agent, mm -hmm. and and the owners want me to be on the board? Mm -hmm. uh, can I serve on the board as a as an owner of a unit who also is employed by the management company? Uh, you cannot be an officer. That's prohibited by the statute. Uh, you can be a member of the board, but you know, for example, if there's issues about the managing contract, of course you gotta like recuse yourself. You cannot vote on that. You have to make disclosures, like any other conflict interest transaction. So the like, summary was that they can you mm -hmm. can serve on the board as an owner because certainly as an owner of a condo, I'd have the same interest in protecting my property. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't be the president, vice president, secretary, treasurer as the employee of the management company. Correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How right. about if I work for another management company? For example, I don't work for the managing agent that represents that association. Mm -hmm. I still would be eligible to be an officer, I would think because I'm not employed by the managing agent of the association. Not at the point, but there's potential conflict there, so you gotta be careful, yeah. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. careful is a, a key word. We'll get into the conflict of interest kind of discussion shortly. Well, how about the resident manager? Can he serve on the board? No, that's prohibited. And so what if the resident manager owned a unit? Could he serve on the board? Still cannot. Cannot. Yes. So the resident manager, no matter what, whether he owns a unit or doesn't own a unit, he cannot serve on the board of directors. Well, that makes sense, you know, based on the, the needs. Now, you know, as you know, board members have a great deal of authority. I mean, they, they, they control the association's money. They can authorize expenses. Can, can an association or a board, let's say, not the association, but can the board say, 
Well, we wanted John on the board. We live in Seattle. We're going to pay his travel expenses to Honolulu for board meetings every year. Well, that's probably not reasonable. But under the statute, actually, the statute allows a board director to attend a meeting, you know, by telephone. Uh, or, you know, these days we have Skype. You know, you can see the person, also listen to his speech at the same time on screen. That's considered as if attending by per in person. Right. Yeah, but you cannot allow a board, like, you know, vote by proxy at a board meeting. That's not allowed. And if, you know, like, every time there's a board meeting, he has to fly or you want the association to reimburse for the, you know, the, the travel expense. That's probably not reasonable, I think. Yeah, I think the statute actually says mm -hmm. it could be done with a majority approval of all the homeowners. As long well as the owners uh, approve. Yeah. So You're that right. you, uh, it actually refers to things such as travel, director's fees, mm -hmm. per diem, you know, that if the owner's majority approve that at an annual meeting, then in fact that's possible. Mm -hmm. Although I have to tell you, I've been doing it a long time. I've never seen a volunteer director paid per diem or travel expenses. The only exception, which we can just talk about briefly, is that, uh, uh, and there's been some debate about this, is that the association is now involved in litigation. Mm -hmm. And a director is subpoenaed to attend by a court mm -hmm. to attend this, uh, this uh, trial. Mm -hmm. That uh, in those cases, it's probable that the association could pay the board members' travel expenses. I don't think there's any clear, definitive ruling on that, but most of the attorneys I've talked to said, look, a court has ordered him to appear mm -hmm. on a date certain. It's not for his personal benefit to mm -hmm. go testify in trial, but he's mm -hmm. been subpoenaed. That in cases like that involving litigation, there may be some reasonable exceptions a board could do to make sure the association protected, because certainly his testimony may be very valuable to the association or very valuable certainly to the proceeding that uh, he gets heard, obviously someone subpoenaed him. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the one that's kind of in that quirky area, for lack of a better word, whether they can do it or not do yeah, it. Yeah, if you consider him as uh, any other witness, I mean, the expenses on that may be considered a legal cost, which you, there may be method you can recover that through the litigation, you know. Right. So, yeah. And I know a lot of times, particularly in arbitration, is construction defect. Board members, they want them to attend that arbitration hearing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. While they try to resolve it, and of course there's settlement discussions, and the, right. the board needs to, the arbitrator always order, orders a, a person with authority to be present at the arbitration. Mm -hmm. That In those cases, if uh, uh, the board had to fly their board member from Maui to Honolulu because the arbitration's in right. Honolulu, I think the word would be caution to the board, and I tell them, the best thing they can always do is put it in the minutes yes. and approve it and explain why they did it. Right. Because that way you have a record of their business judgment, what they did and didn't do. But Exactly. Uh, but in general terms, board members can't be paid for uh, per diem or travel expenses unless they've got the guts to go and say to the, uh, to the owners at an annual meeting, we want to pay this person for this reason. I think the more common thing I see more often than not is whether or not the board at the end of the year doing a small Palahana Christmas party, whether that's considered part of the statute, that they're all going to get together and, and go to some reasonable restaurant and have a glass of wine and thank everybody for the work they did this year, whether they have to have owner approval for that. I mean, uh, I've seen different people say different things about that, you know. Um, but I think if they focus on putting it in the minutes and explaining themselves and it's reasonable. It's not some five-star dinner with thousand-dollar bottle of champagne, but something reasonable. More times than not, boards look at it as a working working session mm -hmm. and, and not something that's for the personal benefit of a director where because we elected him, he lives in Seattle, that we're going to pay his first-class airfare or, or rent him a jet or something to get here. So there are some gray areas with regard to uh, that type of, a, of an issue. Okay, so we're going to take a short break okay. and we'll be right back and I have more questions about conflicts of interest. Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you get excited about my new show, which is Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond. We're going to broadcast on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. Looking to energize your Friday afternoon? Tune in to Stand the Energy Man at 12 noon. Aloha Friday here on Big Tech Hawaii. 
Hi, I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. I'd love you to join us every week, Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. for E Hanakako. Let's work together. We report every week on the good things going on in our state, as well as the better things that can go on in the future. We have guests covering everything from the economy, the government, and society. See you Mondays on E Hanakako at 2 o'clock p.m. Until then, I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. Welcome back to Condo Insider. We're sitting here with Nalan talking about board's duties, primarily what is the fiduciary duty, and we're going to get into conflicts of interest in a minute. I do want to, again, remind our viewers that we have a hotline, 415-871-2474, if you're interested in calling in with a question. But back to, uh, we talked about fiduciary, and I had one little follow-up question on that. Mm -hmm. We talked about directors without the homeowner's approval can't get travel or per diem and those types of fees. How about going to like seminars for CAI or HCCA, Hawaii Council of Community Association, or attending a special course that may be of value to the board? Do they have to have, can a board spend money for education for board members? Yes, as long as, you know, it's reflecting the budget as a line item. Uh, the statute specifically allows that. You know, you think about it, educating yourself to be competent, to serve as a board, that's for the best interest of the association. Right, and so the key words are, it's got to be a separate line item on the budget for mm -hmm. director education, whatever they want to call it. And, uh, and I would say that I know most of the industry organizations are focused on a lot more free education. And so uh, I think it's important that boards realize there are opportunities to learn their craft better and be a better director. Yes. And even if we have a CAI seminar, for example, and it's a luncheon seminar partly subsidized by the Real Estate Commission, if the board approves it, and they have a line item in their budget, they, it's perfectly acceptable to do that. And, and frankly, I would encourage more, member, more, more board members to get involved and, and learn these things. There's a lot of misunderstandings. But now we know what a fiduciary is. The law also says very clearly, and it's uh, 514B-125F, mm -hmm. if you have a conflict of interest, you have to disclose it and you cannot vote. Yes. So what is a conflict of interest? A conflict of interest, uh, there can be two situations. One is you have a, a direct personal interest or a, you know, a monetary interest that's not common to the other homeowners. Uh, the second situation would be an indirect uh, conflict of interest. For example, if you serve in a, another entity as a partner, as a director, as you know, uh, trustee or some, some, some other position where you also owe fiduciary duty to that entity, and then the association, for example, is doing, a, in, in a business transaction with that entity, a very typical example would be association seeking bids on landscaping company. One of the board director happens to be, you know, a member of that company, then apparently you have a conflict of interest there. So in both kind of situations under 414D, that's considered a conflict interest transaction. You got to refrain yourself from voting on that, you got to make disclosure beforehand before the other board director vote on it and reflect that in the board me me meeting minutes. Well, let's just follow up on the landscaping example you gave. Mm -hmm. So this board member is a partner or owner or part owner in this landscaping company. Mm -hmm. And they need to have a landscaping contract and the board is considering and they like his company the best because mm -hmm. maybe it's got the best value, the best mm -hmm. price, best reputation. Mm -hmm. It doesn't prevent the other non-conflicted board members from voting and approving the contract. No, I mean, if you have multiple bids and his company's bid is the best for the association, the other, you know, disinterested board directors can vote for that. And if that's the picked one, you know, it's a valid transaction. And it's probably best that they put in the minutes that the board has considered five bids and they recognize that Director A has a conflict of interest, but the board is voting to approve that contract because we feel it is the most qualified at the best value for the association. Mm -hmm. And so the records are clear that they recognized it, yeah. that they made their business judgment that it's still in the best interest of the association to select that vendor. Uh, as a, So uh, non-conflicted board members can certainly vote to, uh, yeah. to provide a contract to someone who may be in conflict. Yeah, but the one I hear all the time, is, well, you are a board member, 
you can't vote for yourself at the annual meeting for re-election because you have a conflict of interest because you're voting for yourself. Or maybe even further, that the board of directors, because they're going to vote back in fellow board members and owners have given them proxies as a board of director whole, for example, you can't vote your proxies for yourself. That's a misconception. I mean, as, you know, just because you serve on the board doesn't mean your right as a unit owner be taken away from you. I mean, you can still, you know, you know, like, you know, exercise your owner's right at the annual meeting to vote like any other owner. I mean, if owners, other owners give you proxy, you can definitely vote on that. There's just uh, some, um, like, statutory provision you should be aware of that is uh, if the association owns certain units in the building you cannot use that portion to vote for like to elect a board director or something there's um, yeah. prohibition on that and just for clarification mm -hmm. so the association owns two or three units from a foreclosure yes those particular units they couldn't vote the proxy to reelect themselves yes however if you have owners who gave the board of directors a proxy mm -hmm. and they're now voting for election and they're and they're, and they're just owner's proxies are not this mm -hmm. uh, foreclosure proxy I yeah. just discussed. There's nothing improper about them. The, 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 the general presumption of the law is that the owner trusts the board to make the decision and vote mm -hmm. who they think they're most qualified. And mm -hmm. obviously, if they're on the board, they're going to pick themselves probably. Mm -hmm. But that's not illegal and not, and not a conflict of interest to vote. No, with other owner's proxies. Yep. So let's just kind of take an in-between case. Mm -hmm. You have a building, 20 floors, and there's six stacks, mm -hmm. six rows of vertical mm -hmm. rows of condos. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, a major plumbing problem has occurred in stack number two. Mm -hmm. And the entire stack number two, affecting all mm -hmm. 20 owners who live in stack number two, has to be replaced because it's leaking and a potential environmental problem. Mm -hmm. And one of the directors lives in stack number two. Mm -hmm. So it's not the work is being done just for his unit, mm -hmm. but we're taking all the units in stack two mm -hmm. and replacing them all because it's an environmental damage and they've got their bids, they've got their experts saying we have to replace the stack mm -hmm. at number two. Does that prevent the director in stack number two for voting to approve the contract to, uh, to re replace the pipes for all of the owners in stack number two? No, because uh, in this situation, the, the, the personal interest is not uncommon to the other homeowners, you know, because the board, you know, they have the, the duty to actually um, well maintain the common elements to prevent damage to common elements to other units. So it's probably also an emergency situation here. So they got to take action. It would be different, you know, if in your example, there are like a two decks leaking at the same time. If the board's got to decide which stack got to get the first repair done, then, you know, I can see there's the potential, you know, there's a conflict there. So that director probably is better for him to, uh, you know, step aside, just close and reflect in, in the meeting minutes. For smaller boards, uh, it could be an issue if you only have like a three-person board. The best way we recommend to our clients is usually you can set up a committee by a fellow board, disinterested board director, and some unit owners, so that they, you know, decide, make a recommendation to the board what's the best solution in the best interest of the association. That way you address that. See, a lot of times, which is kind of what you said, mm -hmm. we see the problem come up, and it's not, because most board members say, well, I'll just, because I'll just, everybody knows that, that stack two has to be fair. Mm -hmm. He says, I'll, I'll just disclose I live in stack two and I'm not going to vote, I abstain. Yes. And must, what comes to be a problem, to be candid with you, is when these small boards, mm -hmm. and they have a quorum, they need to get the work done because it's an emergency. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a common element problem, this pipe, this stack. Mm -hmm. And so because they need to get the work done, that director feels he's voting for a common repair of a mm -hmm. common element. Mm -hmm. And yes, he happens to live there, but the board owes him a duty as an owner, just like they do all the other owners of stack number two. So. Mm -hmm. I guess the good advice I would say is if it's depending on the size, scope, and dollar value of the work uh, and the emergency nature of it, mm -hmm. um, you then in fact um, ask your attorney or ask for a legal advice or ask for solutions from your management company on how to best protect it. Because I go back to disclosure, mm -hmm. in the minutes, explanation, we made this decision because, because that will protect you best of all with respect to that, you know. Yeah, when in doubt, you know, get professionals advice. That's how you get yeah. covered under the business judgment rule.
And not to talk about the dark <laughs> side, but you know, I think there was a recent case of a timeshare organization where the president had a undisclosed conflict of interest on providing, mm -hmm. I think, furniture to for these timeshare elements. They want the furniture to be alike, and so there's a degree of uniformity that he didn't disclose that he had a part interest, and they got substandard furniture. And I think uh, the court ruled that he had personal liability of about $3 million. Yeah. You know, it was a big case. So boards shouldn't take this lightly. Uh, but to me, uh, most boards I know, they want to do the right thing. And having a thorough discussion, not voting when you're going to get some personal benefit mm -hmm. out of this, which to me is the conflict yeah. in simple terms. Yeah. And uh, making sure the minutes are very clear and irrational will provide you the greatest protection of, uh, of anything you can do. It's back to the minutes and disclosure with respect to those types of issues. Mm -hmm. And so another one I heard, to be candid with you, is that they accused the entire board of having a conflict of interest because they could afford the special assessment for the plumbing repair. And the owners who couldn't afford the special assessment for the plumbing repair, therefore, you had a conflict because you could afford to make the repair and they couldn't make the repair. I don't think that's a conflict of interest. That's a very factual, <laughs> interesting <laughs> inquiry. Well, it could be a, a, a crazy business, you know, at times. Yeah. And uh, um, yeah, but the general, the general thing I tell everybody: look, business judgment, disclosure, mm -hmm. review, openness, transparency, bids, scopes of work, mm -hmm. open discussion, business judgment. Put it in the minutes and define what you did and, and, and why you did it that way. Yes, that's a good practice. And I also, we don't want to scare the board directors from volunteering on this position. There are actually you know, safe harbors in place to try to shield you from personal liability as long as you're not grossly negligent. For example, you have DNO you know, insurance coverage. Uh, some of the project documents also have indemnification clause in place to indemnify you in those kind of situations. But, you know, as a fiduciary, you got to remember, you know, uh, you got to do the right thing, not just uh, for your self-interest try to, you know. Well, let me thank you for being here. We've run out of time, but the, the summary is we've had Nalan talk to us about this. You have important obligations to the association as a fiduciary, and you have important obligations to avoid any conflicts of interest or even appearance of conflicts of interest in my book to make sure the decisions made are in the best interest of the association and fair and equitable all. So thank you for being here today. We welcome you back next Thursday to Condon Insider, although I'm wrong about that. Next Thursday's Thanksgiving turkey day, so we're taking a day off. And all us turkeys are going to go eat turkey. So anyway, we'll see you in two weeks. Aloha.